Hello, everyone out there, and welcome to the event series World Wealth Pandemic European Responses by the Green European Foundation and the Heinrich Böll Stiftung's EU office in Brussels. This is the third online discussion, and today we'll be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the Western Balkans and the region's political future. My name is Simon Ilse. I'm heading the Heinrich Böll Stiftung's office in Belgrade, responsible for the foundation's work in Serbia, Montenegro and Kosovo. And I have with me today three really interesting speakers with three different profiles and country perspectives. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Leila Gacanica. Uh, she's an independent legal counsel and researcher from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Welcome, Leila. Good to have you. Um, second, uh, second of all, we have Liliana Popovska, former MP in the North Macedonian Parliament and leader of Democratic Renewal of Macedonia, DOM, um, and also board member of the Green Institute from North Macedonia. Welcome, Liliana. Um, and last, but certainly not least, we have And um, Andrei Petrovsky, director of tech at Chair Foundation, a digital rights NGO in uh, Belgrade, Serbia. So I'll give each of you um, 10 minutes, Max, to, uh, for opening statements, and then we go straight uh, into a question and answer session with the online audience on the different platforms. Uh, we are currently live on Facebook and, and YouTube, and I will be seeing comments, questions, uh, anything that will be posted on these platforms uh, while, we, while we go ahead and discuss. Before going into the start of the analysis, how the pandemic is influencing our daily lives, as well as our political, environmental, economic, and societal realities in the Western Balkans. Let me just quickly give you an outlook on the dynamics we're looking at. Basically now, in the Western Balkans, we are in the middle of the second wave, um, I would say. We have um, a surge of uh, newly infected people in, in Croatia. Uh, Serbia um, it was just reporting 400 new cases overnight um, from yesterday. There's uh, a lot of cases in, in Montenegro, especially if you look at the, uh, um, the index by 100,000 inhabitants. Also, one should not forget the freedom of movement, basically visa-free travel, which is, um, which, was given, which is a given for the region uh, to the EU, is at the moment suspended. So without a visa, uh, or, or a permanent residency in the EU, uh, people in the, uh, from the Western Balkans cannot travel to the EU at the moment. Um, over this summer of 20, uh, 2020, which has been a very challenging summer for all of us, we had three parliamentary elections in the region, in Serbia, Montenegro, and North Macedonia. Um, all the three of them parliamentary elections, and we had in Kosovo a very abrupt uh, government change. Um, I can say that from, from my perspective, I live in, in Belgrade, I travel the region regularly, but we had a, uh, a, very, um, from a very radical closure in the beginning, uh, then a very radical opening uh, around the time of when the uh, parliamentary election campaign started, and then attempts to lock down again, which was uh, met by um, uh, uprisings, demonstrations, and, and police violence. And, now we are seeing a more balanced approach, but still a proper adaptation of the personal and collective behavior uh, is lacking, I would say. There's no systematic tracing. Um, we've uh, heard about cheating on, on numbers uh, in, the, in the registry of, of newly infected cases in Serbia, but we'll get to all of that. You see already that this pandemic has been very dynamic for, for the whole world, uh, but especially also for for the Western Balkans, and it has really been a, a testing situation for governance, accountability, and truthfulness. So I'm, I'm very happy to um, give the floor now to Leila Gacanica from Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to give us a small uh, opening statement uh, about what's the situation there. Thanks, Leila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for the invitation and, uh, of course, for bringing opportunity to bring a piece of Bosnian perspective in these pandemic times. Uh, what I would really like to emphasize on the very beginning is that all the issues and all the challenges that we were facing uh, before pandemic actually remained and not only remained, but they were even more pronounced. 
Uh, let's start with a complex state structure, which is a barrier to coordination and cooperation between different levels of authority. Uh, we see here, therefore, the pandemic crisis, man crisis management structure was and still is highly decentralized and very complex. I would really also like to give an example of uh, or illustration how that looks in the practice. We actually had, for example, in one entity state of the emergency proclaiming state of different states than normal. And in another entity, we have state of natural or other diseases. So you can actually imagine how this was affecting the response from the government and this eventually caused very different measures in, the, in their scope but also in the protection of the citizens. A uh, pandemic in Bosnia and Herzegovina actually affected a number of political, social and economic rights. Uh, our government, government and government's responses uh, to measures directly affected public health but also impact uh, fundamental freedoms such as uh, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, uh, but also uh, certain kinds of economic activities of the citizens, but also access and right to social protection, actually not making but also deepening the existing gaps in all aspects of private and public life even more pronounced and, and deeper. If it's okay to say, and I believe uh, you already announced it as, as okay, um, to call March and April and May as a first wave of pandemic, uh, then that period in Bosnia and Herzegovina was marked by very early and strong, strong measures. These protection measures, and I would like to establish kind of time frame for this, and I think you already very good announced it. Uh, if we try to kind of take a flow of what is happening and how pandemic impacted, then we can look at protection measures on the first wave, then recovery measures, and eventually, very recently, uh, protection measures again. So when we talk about these first protection measures, they were in Bosnia and Herzegovina very disproper they were not very proportionally uh, posted, and in some cases, human rights violations were registered. So when we talk about violation of, hum of human rights, even in, this in these cases of pandemic or state of emergency or state of natural or other diseases, whatever we formally call it, uh, then we have to be aware that uh, this was caused by inasophic, I'm sorry, uh, with a lack of understanding of, of understanding of human rights responses. But at one hand and another hand, but by not so very well considered implementation of the of the it. So uh, when we go back to the freedom of the move, movement as a uh, fundamental freedom and fundamental right, uh, we saw violations by blanket bans on certain age groups from. Um, going outdoors during the crisis, but we also saw freelance journalists who are working for multiple, multiple media outlets that actually were affected by not being able to provide a so-called free pass from their employer to, to do their job and to move uh, inside of the, of the pandemic times. Also, freedom of the expression was uh, violated by introducing law that was prohibiting the spread of panic and disorder during the state of emergency. In other words, in practice, this meant uh, actually censorship, but also monitoring media uh, and information via social networks. Last but not least, when we talk about violations of uh, fundamental rights, uh, there is protection of personal data violation. And this was actually happening by releasing the data of individuals who tested positive for coronavirus. So these violations of fundamental freedoms and fundamental rights, in some cases, BNH authorities actually promptly re uh, reacted and, and replied to those. But in some other cases, authorities achieved uh, to their decisions after facing criticism. Besides violating the basic human rights and the freedoms, I would also like to emphasize that the measures didn't take into consideration uh, different needs and different position of certain groups like persons with disabilities, uh, uh, victims of domestic violence, refugees and migrants, which are very present in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I would also like to use an example as a very illustrative example 
uh, that occur in a very peak of uh, pandemic and it was related by trying to adopt trying to impose the very harmful labor law in federation of bosnia and herzegovina meaning only one entity uh, and this came actually as a kind of attempt to legalize abuses of abuses of workers rights that arose with a state of of emergency i'm not sure if i should even mention that famous case of corruption uh, by trying to procure procuring medical supplies but also which also indicates what kind of level not only understanding by using corruption in these kind uh, of like not being regular regular times in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we could actually hear from our government that this is a new state, they are not prepared, it's unexpected and we have to learn how to deal with this. So one could actually expect that we learn something and that we will apply some approaches and some uh, measures uh, in time of need, but then then, <laughs> of course, we then have recovery measures, and this is this uh, second flow, I would say, in, in time. And these recovery measures actually actually shown us that little has actually been learned, and the number of warnings that are related to inclusive, proportionate, and justified response have remained unfulfilled. We can see this in very particular related to economic recovery measures, where informal economy was not were lacking, but at the same time, no recovery measures for labor market were predicted. So overall, government's response to COVID-19 has further eroded people's trust in already fragile in weak uh, institutions. On the other hand, civil society organizations and activists are um, talking and being loud about backsliding and actually step in to providing basic service to communities and uh, groups of persons and people who actually needed a special help or, or different, different status. Uh, coming from these rigid, rigid measures. So basically what I would like to emphasize here is regardless that we have civil society organizations and their response in this pandemic situation, we should not abolish our governments from doing uh, further things and taking responsibility for actions and for uh, not only implementing but uh, predicting their measures. So another thing that I would like also to emphasize in this introductory note is that behind the scene of this fighting with the invisible enemy, as our government likes to call pandemic, nationalism continue to flourish, including discourses on the separatism and connecting, linking with so-called home states in the region. To conclude, the pandemic in its all waves has exposed uh, the weaknesses of our state system, but also the fragility of our democratic values. What we actually could see in pandemic is uh, consequences of a systematic and purely uh, formal approach to, democratic, uh, to democracy and to uh, actually being oriented towards maintaining ex existing systems and power relations. This definitely reflected uh, to many ongoing processes in Bosnia and Herzegovina, including EU integration processes. But not to say that everything is lost and nothing could be done. I see European Union as a very important actor in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, the financial help that occurs during the pandemic was very much needed and it was provided. But we should not lost from, uh, lose from our side that investment do not guarantee democracy. So what I would definitely advocate for is more value-based EU approach and the more value-based uh, push in our actually integration process in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I will stop here to leave enough time for other uh, colleagues and I'm looking forward to discussion. Thanks a lot, Leila. Thank you very much for this um, overview and give, uh, giving out, um, uh, presenting to us a few of the trends. I think it's becoming very clear that uh, the governments of the region have, uh, of the region haven't really shied away from um, from continuing their their basic interest in in uh, in keeping staying in power um, even even in the face of this uh, pandemic and that uh, other uh, already uh, ongoing trends uh, have have continued uh, nevertheless. Uh, just a very short follow-up question, Leila, on this um, on this procurement um, corruption case. That's uh, of course a drastic example of um, 
of corruption in such a life-saving field. But at the same time, uh, there, there has been an indictment, no, hasn't there? Uh, they, I think this this case was was uh, followed up um, judicially and and brought to brought to court. Where well, am I wrong? Yes, you are you are right, but it's still ongoing. And what we see here, okay. it's not more it's not anymore in the focus of the public. Now we have another wave of the pandemic, so kind of shadowed, I would say. But it's, mm. it's before the court, and I really hope that this will send a message that yeah. not all these kind of cases, especially not in a situation like this, are allowed and that a legal state or institution will show kind of um, kind of example on this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Liliana, uh, the floor is yours to, to give us an, an overview of what's, uh, how's it been in North Macedonia. Thank you. You're still mute. Everyone? Yeah, uh, now. No, now you're fine. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, the COVID crisis is a shock for the society, bringing new rules and uh, taking away the normal life. Uh, uh, it affects people psychologically, bringing fear, stress, uncertainty. The distance that is asked for prevention of the disease is unnatural to the people, especially for us in Macedonia, in Balkan countries, we are used to be very close to each other, to, to live together, to gather a lot. So it is really difficult to keep the distance with your friends, with your, with, with your family. Uh, but uh, the COVID crisis hit uh, very uh, strongly the economy of uh, our countries, of Macedonia also. And uh, the stronger uh, hits in the weaker countries. Uh, so it is an attack to economy and to jobs. So at the moment, uh, 50, more, more than 50,000 uh, people left uh, jobless, are left jobless in Macedonia, although the government uh, gave uh, organized four uh, economical packages to support uh, uh, employment and to support uh, small businesses. And also uh, thousands of businesses are working at the edge, edge, and we don't know what will happen in the next, uh, next uh, future. Politically, the COVID crisis is a test for uh, democratic capacity of the leadership and society in general. And I can say that Macedonia passed this test pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good. Uh, the freedom of speech is guaranteed and kept uh, through electronic and social media, through the parliamentary debate, through uh, 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 local uh, councils and uh, everywhere. So uh, there are, of course, all kinds of talking, uh, constructive and not constructive, uh, true stories and fake news. But what is important is that the mainstream of these talkings, of these debates is democratic and open-minded, and it prevailed. So this is, this is uh, very important. Uh, Macedonian government succeeded to handle the crisis somehow, even uh, very good in the, in the beginning from uh, March to uh, June. And uh, the hero, let's say, uh, in brackets, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, period was the Minister for Healthcare, uh, who, uh, who got over 80% of trust uh, by the citizens, uh, because he was extremely transparent and he was giving information each day on press conferences and answering along uh, to each question from the, from the journalists. And the journalists were connected with the, with the citizens who also uh, could uh, ask questions uh, through them. So this procedure was very important to, to make people come to, 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 to make come in this difficult uh, situation. So um, even this uh, lockdown was passed on a re relatively uh, uh, normal way, believing that uh, the people believe that they are doing something that is uh, good uh, for, for for common good, and uh, Macedonia was very good with uh, good, uh, let's say, with results. We had very low results of uh, of uh, uh, infected people and of, of mortality rate. Uh, so uh, it was even surprising uh, result for many citizens, and the trust in institutions raised also in general. Uh, so it was uh, good to see that uh, the country uh, performed as a stable country and organized country in difficult time, because we had a lot of a lot of stress uh, stresses uh, in the in the in the past, and really it was um, uh, interesting feeling for the people to keep uh, uh, that uh, that uh, the country is uh, is organized in so such a difficult uh, situation, uh, and people were dedicated to common good. 
as they believed, and yeah, that was uh, some kind of cohesion in the society. What is even more interesting is that all this happened during the technical government because uh, the parliament was dismissed and we were waiting for the early elections. They were, uh, they were, uh, they had to be uh, uh, held uh, in April, but then uh, they were, uh, because of the COVID crisis, they were postponed for, for June and finally uh, held in, uh, in uh, July, 15 uh, July. But even this uh, technical government where opposition was inside, together with position, with governmental majority, uh, they both uh, uh, succeeded to, to, to give a decent, uh, le let's say, a performance in this difficult uh, time. But what happened after that, after this relatively uh, good uh, performing, uh, the daily politics ruined everything. Uh, as we, we uh, came closer to the data of uh, elect election data, uh, the, the, the political debates started uh, and um, not uh, on, on not uh, a very very uh, decent way uh, uh, every time and uh, the political parties uh, uh, did uh, something very bad they they started to play with the religious feelings of the citizens because uh, may was uh, the period of time where when in Macedonia there are there a lot of uh, uh, holidays, some religious, some national, uh, and uh, uh, each party was playing with its own voters and giving uh, a permission, let's say, to the, 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 the some part of the voters, let's be free, we uh, survived the COVID crisis, we are uh, above it, so it was completely foolish, completely foolish. And what happened? We got the second wave of, of COVID crisis in uh, June, and we entered the election period in July with a very, very high, high number. So it was uh, really uh, not, uh, not very, uh, very clever. Uh, finally, the Macedonia passed the parliamentary elections well organized according to OSC uh, mission. Uh, what uh, to say about the democratic freedoms? We cannot speak about real democratic freedom uh, with lockdown and police time. It is not a normal democratic pattern of living, definitely. But I believe uh, in our country, these emergency measures were implemented pretty carefully without misuse, according to the instructions of the uh, World Health Organization and according to the uh, main uh, democratic uh, rules and framework. Uh, we must say that uh, the restrictions for free movement are having uh, partly negative impact to civil society, of course, because there is less gathering and direct communication. But civil activists are loud on the social media, organizing Zoom events, raising petitions like the one for saving the rivers against small hydro uh, power plants, and also organizing different activities in the environment. And uh, civil society in Macedonia is alive and, and uh, is, uh, is pretty persistent uh, in each situation and in this also. And uh, there are, uh, it raises a debate about democracy, hate speech, fake news. When we speak about hate speech, in general, uh, I must say that the news about COVID are shared uh, in our country on a transparent way constantly, with precise details. We didn't uh, hide the number of infected and passed away as in some other countries. Opposite of it, our authorities even counted uh, COVID as COVID victims, those who, who, who died from different reasons, but that were uh, after post-mortem uh, found out that they were infected. Anyway, there was a period somewhere in the middle of the crisis, late spring, early summer, it was the same in, in other countries in the world as I, I, I noticed, when the fake news uh, about COVID as disease was spread among the people very on a, on a massive way. So there were individuals uh, who did not believe that it exists, others that thought it was not a dangerous disease, and then different stories about the origin, way of transfer, natural, artificial, and so on and so on. The world uh, is global, and uh, uh, through internet, each story uh, is getting its own supporters. So uh, we are not, uh, we cannot exclude from this as a, as a country. But uh, uh, what is important that the government, the civil society, and most of the reasonable citizens started a campaign through electronic, social media, from uh, on different way, uh, with scientific explanations about the COVID. 
and the number of fake news is now very much diminished and more people have raised awareness. Unfortunately, uh, some because of their personal bad experience with uh, COVID by them or by uh, some uh, their relatives or friends. Uh, but anyway, uh, we we got uh, the the uh, the rise uh, enormous rise of uh, the number of uh, infection uh, in the late summer and early autumn. It is some kind of third wave in Macedonia. Uh, there are still mm. uh, people who don't believe uh, how virulent COVID is. Uh, but uh, now the focus of debate is more on the new preventive measures, wearing or not masks in open space, sitting in small numbers in the bars, restaurants, homes, and so on. So I think that the stories about the, the, the nature of COVID will come again, uh, come again uh, uh, with the start of a vaccination, like everywhere in the world. But I, I lost, okay. them. I, I, I passed these 10 minutes, and I will uh, later. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thanks a lot, uh, Liliana, for this first uh, opening. Um, actually, fake news and um, and the whole uh, disinformation uh, universe um, is a good uh, is a good and elegant way to lead over to to Andre. Andre prepared a small presentation actually that he will show to us. Um, I hope we can start it now, since it's your turn. Yeah, there it is. Um, yes, great. Yeah, I'm just gonna go full screen now so that you can see it nicely is everything all right good perfect. so yes, i decided perfect. to title this presentation the short presentation curfew versus the internet because i'm going to be tackling on uh what basically our response as share foundation was to uh what happened around us um so Compared to North Macedonia, which was clearly a good example when dealing with the crisis, at least for the most part in the first wave. Um, unfortunately, when we speak about Serbia, we could not say the same thing. Um, many things happened and we tried to articulate them in this form of a metro map using a few different, different lines uh, along the map and calling the train COVID-19 Express. Um, so obviously we have the infodemic uh, uh, line, which is consisted of series of events that deal mostly with different sorts of uh, manipulations with information on, on different levels. We obviously have the pandemic map and uh, a line and everything that happened uh, along along it. We have the digital rights map, which uh, line, which is our core uh, interest and uh, the the line on which we had most. Uh, response and um, information system COVID-19 map a line which in, in a way um, was uh, probably uh, the core of all the scandals that, that happened in Serbia. We also tackled the region in a bit so I'm going to say just a word or, or, or two about different countries in the region but let's get back to the beginning. At the end of February Serbia still had no uh, confirmed cases of COVID, and then um, Dr. Vladimir Nestorovic, together with the president uh, of the country, Aleksandr Vucic, um, uh, publicly in the media said that this virus only exists on Facebook and invited people to go shopping in Italy. Uh, then, at the beginning of March, meaning that some week after this happened, we had the first confirmed case in Serbia, uh, nine days afterwards, the state of emergency was declared by uh, President uh, Aleksandar Vucic. And then a series of different events um, happened, uh, especially uh, when it comes to digital rights. And this is the period which had most dramatic impact on different, different statements by, by politicians. Uh, namely, the president stated that they're going to monitor Italian phone numbers uh, uh, roaming in, 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 in Serbia and monitor their, their movements, which is clear violation of uh, the surveillance restrictions. Um, that somehow motivated us to initiate, together with the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, a regional uh, monitoring um, uh, database which would gather all the cases uh, of digital rights violations in Serbia but, but also in other countries in, in Southeast Europe. 
Um, then by the end of March, we had cases in which uh, from the national um, telco, telecom operator, uh, SMS messages were sent to the citizens by the crisis committee saying that we're looking at Italian or Spanish scenario that a huge number of people will be will be um, infected uh, and then plays along the line of somehow uh, playing the discourse in this direction of panic, which definitely is not something that was favorable to, to the state in which most people were at the moment. Um, by the beginning of April, we had the first and most, uh, let's say, notorious arrest uh, within this period where a journalist who published a story about the capacities of the healthcare system in Vojvodina, uh, in the north of Serbia, um, and their limitations was, was arrested, allegedly for spreading false information. Um, after the reaction of um, civil society in Serbia and international organizations, she was released some 48 hours after that, and that um, that case were, was somehow closed uh, in the in the process. Her mobile phone and her laptop were taken away from her, but they were returned uh, soon afterwards. Uh, and then we go to the probably most uh, uh, grave, let's say, most serious uh, thing that happened during this pandemic, and that's the entire stream with the information system COVID-19, which is uh, an information system that the um, government of Serbia created at the beginning of the of the crisis. Um, it was uh, formed in the in, 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 in the end of March, uh, whereas some 10 days after it was established, we noticed that uh, the password, the username and the password for one of the hospitals uh, uh, that, were, that they, they were supposed to use for login was um, uh, leaked, uh, basically unintentionally published uh, to to it was indexed, indexed by Google. So uh, through a simple Google search, you could you could get to it. That's how we got to it, and then reported the case to the uh, adequate authorities. This case has not had has not been closed, uh, so it's no uh, accountability has been has been um, uh, proclaimed in 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 this situation, but. This shows the way the state treated um, the data of the infected people, the people who were tested, infected or not, uh, which were contained is in this um, information system. As a response to that, we published um, a guidebook, uh, which can be found on this uh, uh, URL. It's in Serbian, so uh, it's for BHS as speakers um, only, unfortunately, uh, and it, goes to uh, show how, uh, what are the standards of protection of, of data in the healthcare system and how, um, what the framework is uh, and how data should be protected in, in such systems. Um, by the beginning of May, we saw introduction of regular state. Uh, it was speculated that the biggest reason for that was to be able to proceed with the election campaign, which uh, actually, actually happened and then soon afterwards we saw a thousand screens around the president of Serbia holding the first um, virtual rally where the faces of supporters of the of the Serbian Progressive Party were uh, surrounding the president in an empty echo uh, echoing uh, chamber in which he gave his his initial speech he had a few of those so we had as um north macedonia did and and as montenegro had parliamentary uh elections during uh, the the basically period of 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 covid crisis um bearing in mind the results it it, it shows how how the political landscape in serbia is shifting towards something that's quite closed but uh, during the, the campaign, we basically saw no campaign at all. Uh, there was practically uh, no uh, political messages that were stream, streamed uh, uh, strong, either from the side of, of, of the opposition who was in a way boycotting the election or from the side of the government with any pro, 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 program messages or something. We ended up with a parliament that's basically exclusively uh, um, government without without opposition without uh, opposition parties, so um, it's going to be interesting few years in 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 Serbia when it comes to 
to democracy in general and of course digital digital and all other rights uh on the 21st of june we had the actual uh, elections besides besides parliamentary elections we also had um uh, local uh, elections and uh, elections in the autonomous region of vojvodina uh so there were measures that were in place the campaign uh was obviously uh, held to some extent online but it was not as i said before uh it did not really um communicate any any strong messages um on the on the stream of uh lack of trust in the information system that i mentioned before uh the balkan investigative reporting network um their their serbian office uh basically published a story that there there is inconsistency between the numbers uh, that were published by on the press conferences on a daily basis and the numbers contained in the information system it played there was entire drama surrounding it um, with the prime minister saying that uh, the information system is unreliable whereas she herself a few weeks before that said that this is the only reliable uh, system there is then they ended up blaming the IT department for mixing something up uh, as i mentioned before this case has not been uh, cleared fully so uh, basically to this day there is a major lack of trust uh between the society and um uh, let's say establishment when it comes to the number of infected uh people and the people who have died of covid-19 uh for this purpose we we produced to just clarify the entire system we produced a short video uh, explainer uh which is published on our youtube channel um it's a short video explaining how this system should work and it's collaged with different statements by different government officials uh the beginning of july and the potential reintroduction of not state of emergency but rather restrictions of of movement brought us to the protests which happened in belgrade which were the reaction of the public to the proposed measures uh that uh uh crisis committee supposedly had towards the government uh those were unacceptable for the uh citizens and they decided to um react there was a few days of political unrest in 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 Serbia and it's interesting that the first night of the protest is, there was only one tv channel without national frequency that 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 basically streamed uh live from from the location the national tv and all the other tv stations that do have uh uh free uh, these national frequencies meaning that they're available on the territory of the entire country uh did not uh, actually did not actually um show what was happening in the streets uh of Belgrade now when it comes to the region there was the electronic electronic communications act in 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 Croatia uh, which um somehow tried to introduce um let's say bigger uh, mandate to the law enforcement to basically monitor the the movement and and other aspects of uh communications to to uh, basically be used uh in 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 crisis management in this case um uh, well in in montenegro a list of infected people was was published not by the government but it was leaked by by someone from working at a, in a, in a hospital um then uh in bosnia and herzegovina i think that leila mentioned the law that uh, was basically used to find people for um expressing their opinions on social media um which which uh, basically accused them of spreading spreading uh, panic uh, and 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 social unrest uh that on on those grounds these these people were 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 fined uh then there is the contact tracing application in north macedonia which uh is the basically only country that went um let's say into execution with the contact tracing uh application the application was approved by the um, uh, i mean it was in line with the standards of the of the council of europe when it comes to uh this type of applications uh it did um from what we know respect all the standards of data protection and and uh basically gave the users power to control their data so it could not be abused for surveillance or for movement monitoring 
Um, finally, a similar application was used in, in, in Slovenia and talks about it started in Serbia, but we still haven't seen anything practical about it yet. So this would okay. be my short introduction. Yeah. Thanks uh, a lot. And I'm happy to answer any uh, questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Andre. Thanks for um, thanks for the ride on the COVID Express, <laughs> basically. Uh, that was very, uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, presentation and we already have a few uh, few very positive comments on that. Uh, so let's uh, let's jump straight into the discussion um, since we're running a bit out of time already. Um, there's a first question um, that I'm posing to to all of you and you can just see um, who would like to respond first. Um, Rob Lewis is asking, do you have any thoughts on the issues of herd population immunity and connections with an alt far right ideological agenda? It seems to be pushed under the cover of freedom and an end to an interfering nanny state. What are your thoughts on this and your recommended responses to the growing movement? So I think that's, an, um, that's a discussion that, is, that we see uh, in the States uh, um, uh, a lot. Um, who would like to uh, share their thoughts on, on this question? Basically, any interconnections between population immunity like herd immunity concepts and uh, and the far right is there is there is there any such things in in the western balkans from your point of view i mean i i could start when it comes to social media and and uh spreading of fake news digitally this it has does have close ties to ties to um anti-vaxxing movements and other similar yeah. structures that are I mean, traditionally connected to a more, let's say, right uh, ideology in, in, in that regard. So people, um, yeah, we could see pages of, of that background to sharing some, some sort of information. Mm. Uh, whereas in the public discourse as such, herd immunity was used in various different scenarios, even though it was never the official policy of the of the of the state as especially at least when it comes to, to serbia i don't know about other 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 countries i don't know yeah. if any in the countries in the region did actually um proceed with herd herd uh, immunity policy yeah i think we heard it from uh, sweden as an example and then it, it never actually did completely disappeared as, as a discussion just uh, to also give the floor to liliana and, and leila and um, there's a second question that's actually a bit interrelated that's that asks um, how do you explain that fake news spreading happened at different periods from one country to another? Uh, maybe you can you can um, um, actually blend that question in your response as well. Would like to start, uh, Liliana? Maybe. Yours? Well, yeah. I think that uh, this uh, uh, connection between uh, uh, st uh, opinion about uh, vaccination and uh, Political orientation. Uh, there is some connection, but uh, in our country, not not direct, uh, not directly, because in fact, uh, uh, there are people who are who are um, in uh, who, who believe in this fake uh, news from any side. Maybe more uh, that are among those who are uh, closer to the right uh, uh, right uh, political wing, but not not much. At the beginning, there was a small. Uh, uh, like movement, not movement. Some some meetings in front of the government, but there were 50 people, not more, that tried to demonstrate against the measures and such things. But it was it was not uh, not uh, something that uh, that was very influential. Uh, 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 and what is important that uh, both uh, uh, leftist and rightist uh, political parties in Macedonia uh, are, are fighting for. For better uh, measures and anti-COVID measures, so I cannot say that in our country it is directly uh, connected. Although, according to what we see in in the world press, in the world media, the, there is a connection. We can, we could see that in in United States, uh, for example, it was uh, very obvious that the the, the, the re Republicans were uh, much more opposing uh, to belief uh, to to the COVID uh, to to to, uh, no. to the scientific explanation than the Democrats, but uh, uh, in, in, in Balkan, I wouldn't say it is not uh, connected and about uh, different countries. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the same uh, fake news were just flowing from uh, one country to another. 
and uh, mm. almost in the similar time uh, in May, April, April, May, they were they flourished all over the world. Uh, Anti-vaxxers and and different movements who, that are in fact anarchistic, I would say, not rightist, anarchistic movements from any type, extra leftist, extra rightist. They both are connected. What we saw in Macedonia mm -hmm. at that small meeting in front of the government during the, 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 the spring, let's say, uh, it was a small, pretty funny meeting of people who were some extra left, leftist and some extra rightist and some from nowhere. They just Interesting. The balance. Yes. So it is, very mixed. it is a confusion in some minds in both people who doesn't trust to science. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's also the debate a little bit of what kind of this content is being expressed on the streets and in front of uh, uh, government buildings and what is happening online um, exclusively. Uh, Leila, would you like to comment still on, on this part or should we continue? Yes, I would like just to, just to say shortly a few things. Um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as did all this complexity and everything and nationalism and yeah. dividing everything and free, uh, when we had pandemic and when the panic started to to like spread all over, that was a great, great uh, let's say carpet where we put like on the on the surface and we talk and we were concerned concerned only and exclusively about our health. So what was happening behind was mainly uh, not visible to the people, but the nationalistic tend tendencies remained. And what actually our national leaders did is to con consolidate their hold on power. So mm. basically to connect this to far right, is quite easy in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I think we saw that from June or May and even now, and we are looking to local elections and you can see now many things misusing as andre already said we, we are looking at that scenario in bosnia and herzegovina right now how pandemic will be used or misused to to manipulate uh, people in bosnia and in, in mm -hmm. herzegovina regarding fake news uh, it is also a consequence of not having organized uh, at the same level same source and safe source of information so information were everywhere so people was quite confused and was also what contributed to fake news and to spreading the panic was also the thing that some people like people with disabilities or people without technological equipment could not access to, to most of the information. So it was circulated via Viber, Facebook, social networks and those informations that were cir circulating was really dangerous and definitely, definitely impacted bad on, on like having yeah. Right information in right time and in right place. So I yeah. think that's quite connected. Thank you. Yeah, I find it actually quite fascinating. We're now in the middle of uh, the debate about uh, freedom of speech and and um, and basically freedom to access of information and to to uh, uh, like basic um, accuracy of data. And I find it more and more actually a cross cutting topic uh, from from here, the, the Belgrade and, and, and Serbia perspective, maybe, but I, I see it also in, in other countries that really the um, there can be more and more disinformation and manipulation. The, the, the more vague the data is, the more disinformation and manipulation there can be. And that is really true for uh, COVID data and CO2 uh, registry, um, data on air quality, um, any uh, data actually, even on economic development and so on, we, we, um, we see that these, these numbers are unclear, intransparent of how they're being um, um, gained and, and uh, statistically um, uh, aggregated. So I think that's really one of the big topics that we have to look at. Actually, uh, Andre, I have a question for you. It's a, it's a more of a um, a general question, Jerko uh, Zlatar asks, how do you balance the freedom of speech and the need to protect the public from in, uh, intentional and organized disinformation campaigns? Um, sorry, did you get that or you want me to repeat? Did you ask me? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, how do you balance? Well. It is really hard to draw a line between uh, free speech and 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 um, uh, hate speech in in in, um, in in many situations actually, and it's now really really 
the the important question is who has the authority to to control such things if you give it to the hands of the government it can be potentially tricky north macedonia did have a strategy for uh battling uh disinformation at some point which was quite uh, quite well thought i don't know whether it's um basically implemented or whether it works in practice in serbia we still don't have any framework when it comes to uh how the government deals with disinformation anyway in a situation in which you have deep lack of trust between the government and the society i would stay really cautious in giving governments any sort of power to control flow of information online on the other side we see platforms that start yielding political power which is uh, as strong as many countries now uh for example facebook as a platform did have a role in the elections in 2016 in the United States and probably many other uh political and um, democratic processes so these um companies do have a lot of power their response to the moment is not really adequate uh when it comes to uh how do they deal with this spread of spread of false information within their their networks there are some efforts but it's still it's a long shot well, i think that at the moment there are no um uh, i mean there are some probably disinformation or misinformation online related to this topic but i think that there are other topics that are more let's say uh, hot at the moment because in in most cases uh disinformation unless Uh, we, if we exclude political manipulation they do uh, fall in the domain of clickbaiting so you need more clicks from uh readers in order to generate some profit yeah okay thank you i would like to just um quickly there's no more questions at the moment from the online audience but i would have a, another aspect just zooming out a little bit and and bringing in maybe the um ecological environmental um dimension in in this covid-19 crisis i mean there's been a lot of talk about um okay now the tension is clearly on on covid-19 and and combating this pandemic so at first no more time and resources for really combating um continuing to combating the climate crisis um and it was even sometimes suggested that uh, or now anyways uh, people flew less and there was less uh, emissions because economy um, economies uh, slowed down so we would somehow there was it was suggested that we gained some time which um which i think is a actually pretty dangerous suggestion but um now we see that there's a recovery package proposed by the eu commission for the western balkans in actually rebuilding um the economy uh, in the western balkans and um and there's 10 flagship projects um proposed and actually quite a few of them talk about transitioning away from coal um renewable energy um uh, promotion uh, green new deal uh, issues being addressed like circular economy and so on how where do you see actually how do you see these mechanisms um succeed yes yeah. yeah, sure yeah Uh, thank you Simon. Uh, I think uh, you you tackle uh, the the very uh, uh, important uh, sense uh, of 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 this green transition on, on in Balkans because uh, in fact most of the Balkan uh, governments uh, are trying to get through the economic crisis with mega projects and yeah. all of such mega projects are in fact danger for the for the nature so mm. like operate on water in, for serbia 80 mm. uh, mining mining in uh, small macedonia uh, uh, hydro uh, small hydro mm. uh, power small hydro power plants yeah. and so uh, these are these are the, the same story everywhere in fact uh, even when there is no corruption uh, in the mind of, of of some politician even if if it's not uh, they are they are entering uh, the 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 issue they don't understand and they don't understand from the environmental point of view at all and they still think in in the way of old fashioned uh, way of doing business let's do it big let's do it yeah. big, big that the next future uh, generation will 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 know what have i done so it is completely uh, foolish and stupid and uh, i would ask that european uh, european countries european uh, uh, funds uh should uh, take more care about uh, about such projects 
and what are they stimulating, what are they supporting and what not. Because I must say, speaking about corruption, corruption in environment, it is something that cannot be done without support of uh, EU uh, uh, civil servants or bankers, together with mm. our our uh, uh, criminals uh, in, in all levels of, of the society. So uh, we must fight corruption in, in, in the environment. It is something that is very dangerous. And we must uh, work on raising awareness of the politicians. Uh, the citizens have even, I can say, say for Macedonia, and I see this is uh, very similar in all Balkan uh, countries. Uh, the, the awareness, uh, the environmental awareness of the citizens is much higher than those of the politicians. Okay. We as Green mm. parties are not strong enough to, to form our government and to mainstream this agenda, so we yeah. really need European support in, uh, yeah. about the Balkans. Yeah, and Dom from North Macedonia is maybe, uh, maybe an interesting example since they now joined the government of Zaev. Hopefully they will be um, instrumental in, in also applying some of these environmental policies um, in the years to come. Uda and Montenegro is another one. Um, we saw Mojimo in, uh, in Croatia. Uh, that will be, I think, yeah, that's key that, that this nexus of corruption and, um, and environmental policies is, is being met um, because it's a very strong one. Uh, Leila, did you want to comment on, on that part as well? or? Uh, just briefly, I would like to add that a uh, similar situation in Bosnia is in Bosnia and yeah. Herzegovina. As Liliana said, it's almost completely in the hand of the citizens and it is expected from, from them to raise their voices against and uh, all this thing about ecology and, and green justice is related more to some kind of alternative narrative uh, when it comes to government. And I'm quite uh, disappointed. Uh, we could see lately that our prime minister, Fadil Novalic, ended up on the Facebook page or something uh, from Leonardo DiCaprio praising him for not uh, stopping this like mini plants, uh, hydro plants. But at the same time, we are very easily forgetting that the same government and the same uh, positions actually very violent attacked women from the Kroščica River who tried to stop building this hydro, hydro plant. So I think this is really, really serious question that we are really pushing on the Americans. And I'm quite sure and I'm quite uh, convinced that we need kind of push up from the EU level downstairs because otherwise I don't think our uh, governments will recognize this as uh, important questions or even enough important questions to raise. Yes, thank you. I think, um, yeah, that's actually an important point. Uh, there's on the one hand, these mega projects that are being continued. On the other hand, the small hydropower plants um, actually apparently advanced and actually got accelerated over the um, last couple of months because everybody had, had to stay in. Um, I just have um, yeah, Liliana very quickly and then we have to actually already come to a close. I just want to, to illustrate how important is EU help, help of EU friends and especially from the Green uh, family. Because we as, uh, as DOM, as a Green Party, we were part of the government in the last uh, four years and uh, we, uh, we are fighting together with the civic movement against mining. Uh, for closing the mines and we succeeded to close two mines and to bring a law uh, for mineral uh, resources that is uh, banning uh, use of cyanide and uh, sulfur sulfuric acid and mm -hmm. what is important although we were only two MPs in the parliament in fact we uh, had support from uh, from uh, our uh, EGP from our green friends, uh, Reiner Butikofer and uh, uh, other colleagues, they were coming to Macedonia, lobbying on international conferences organized by DOM, by Green Institute and the other NGOs. And we fight together. They were lobbying directly the prime minister. And what is important that uh, the prime minister, Zaif, we must admit that he had, uh, had uh, he listened to the arguments and he yeah. really did uh, according to the, to the law and to the, to the procedures. Yeah, he uh, seems to be some kind of positive um, exception for the region so far, I would say. Um, about mining. Uh, about I, <laughs> but we, yeah, about transitioning away from coal and closing the mines, we are still dreaming about that in Serbia. Um, yeah. but, but I'm just saying, I think these investment packages and, and the just, we always say, talk about this just transition mechanism that is part of the Green New Deal. And, and I think actually, funds coming from the European Union should really be allocated along along this mechanism um, to, to make sense because you can't just close down. There's a comment also here from the audience on, on the Kolubara 
Basin and Kolobara um, coal power plant in uh, just outside Belgrade um, and just send everybody home uh, into unemployment, you have to provide some kind of um, structural transition of these regions and of these um, human beings that, that, that cannot just be sent to, to unemployment. I think that's important. Um, okay, we have to come to a close. Uh, this has been a uh, very short lived and, and, uh, and one hour online discussions, but I like this, these formats of one hour online discussions because we have so many these days. And, um, and I think we, we still managed to have an interesting exchange. Thanks very much to, um, to all the three of you, uh, the panelists, Andre, Liliana and, um, and Leila. And thanks also to the audience for chipping in with your questions and your thoughts. Um, thanks to uh, Jeff and, and Henrik Böll Brussels for inviting us all and um, and stay tuned for the next episodes of this uh, of this series um, worldwide pandemic European responses yes that's the title thank you all the best thank you bye bye, bye.